Welcome back to another episode of the Startup Therapy Podcast. This is Ryan Rutan, joined, as always, by Will Schroeder, my friend, the founder and CEO of Startups.com. Will, we both have a lot of experience in the startup space. It's a nice way of saying that we're old, but we do have a lot of startup experience. And I think generally that's viewed as an asset. But are there times where being less experienced might be an advantage? I think so. Actually, <laughs> I don't think I've realized how much of an advantage that is until I've started to get older with more experience. <laughs> yep. And I'm realizing how many things that I won't do now because I have the bias of experience. And I start to think about how much danger that is. And I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple of days ago, my daughter, Summer, turning 11, it's her birthday. She comes to me and says, Dad, I'd really like to go skiing today. And it was like a nice enough day outside, right? You know, it's middle of January right now. And I'm like, yeah, sure, let's go. So we hop in the car and we head to the mountain. Now, a couple of things. Number one, I haven't been on a snowboard in 10 years, right? So when she says like, hey, let's just go skiing, it's not like it's something we do all the time, right? Like, And it's not like riding a bike, right? <laughs> at all, right? She's been skiing a bunch. She actually goes skiing at her school. So, you know, she's, she's better at it. Yeah, she's also closer to the ground. Yeah, exactly. So we get to the mountain and I'm, I'm starting to think, I'm like, you know, I've only been snowboarding a handful of times. Like I, I don't even remember if I know how to snowboard. I don't remember how, it's been so long, I don't even remember how it went last time. I can't imagine it went well. So we get to the top of the mountain. I'm staring down the mountain and she's ready to go. And I think to myself at that very moment, the difference between me going down the mountain and you going down the mountain is you don't know like what will happen if things don't yep. go well, right? Like, you yep. have a vague idea that you could get injured, but all I can think about <laughs> It's what's going to go wrong, right? Which is going to prevent me from being good at it. Yeah. And again, and, and so I, I started, you know, I really started to kind of build on that notion of in how many ways as a founder is my experience, you know, my battle scars preventing me from making leaps, which is kind of what we do for a living because I'm afraid of the consequence because I already know how this thing ends. And I think it's an interesting thing to explore. It is for sure. It's funny, man. I didn't realize we were living parallel lives in different temperature bands this weekend. So I was <laughs> I was surfing. We were both sliding around on water on a board. Yours was just in a solid state. Similar thing. Like I am not a surfer. I've surfed, you know, a handful of times. Recently learned a little bit more, but recently is being like over a year ago. And so we just rented a board this time and went out. Aria, my nine-year-old, wanted to go surfing. So I was like, cool, we'll do it. We, we've been boogie boarding, bodyboarding up to that point. It was like, she wanted to surf, surf. I'm like, okay, let's do it. And then she's like, daddy, can you show me the part, like exactly like how you stand up again? <laughs> I laid down on the board and I'm like, I remember this. I remember. And I went through the movement and she looks at me and goes, yeah, that, that wasn't it. She's like, <laughs> well, that's how I remember it. And I think this is part of the danger in, in utilizing our experiences too, is that Sometimes like we don't recount the experiences all that accurately. And so like I was clearly sharing her a technique and she's like, yeah, I'm going to try something else. And sure enough, like <laughs> we go out and out of 10 attempts, I can tell you who got up eight out of 10 times and who got up zero out of 10 times. Yeah, and yeah, I, exactly. Right. Yep. I think, you know, where we can start kind of unpacking this a bit is talking about the bias of experience, how our experiences, the things that, that we think we've learned or that we've you know, been educated around actually provide a dangerous bias that prevent us from doing lots of things. And, and here's the analogy I would use. Imagine that for years, you found the best path to go to work, right? You just got, you know, the, the most efficient way to drive to, to avoid as much traffic as possible. And for years and years and years, that probably works out great. In that time, the city's worked on all different roads, all different paths, subdivisions have gone up, you know, bypasses, whatever. And there's now a way more efficient way to get to work but you don't know it because you've picked your way that you do things. You stop exploring new ways because you don't even realize that you should. And all of a sudden there's a better, more efficient way to get home, right? You know, you, you can get home faster. And again, the analogy is just rough, but it represents a lot of things. Ryan, when you and I think back on our, you know, 30 years of experience in building startups and just life in general, our bias says, yeah, generally don't do those things. And I would bet, I would bet, eight out of 10 times is actually helping us. It's the other two that I'm concerned about. Yeah, it's tough. I gave this a lot of thought middle of last year. I read this book by Adam Grant called Think Again. And it was all about the concept of sort of challenging what you think you know, so that you can better know what you don't know. And there, there's a lot of power in that, right? Like, I think, you know, as we look at this, the bias of our experience, because again, things do change, right? Like if I just sat down and was like, 
somebody asked me a question in our session yesterday on getting customers and they said, Hey, would you mind telling us some stories about early customer acquisition at startups.com? And we could think that would help us. And I was like, okay, sure. I can tell you the stories. Caveat, be real careful with the details here because what worked then, I can tell you in a couple of these scenarios will not work now, specifically thinking about things like Google AdWords and how we'd optimize that account, you would do something entirely different now. If you did what I did back in, in 2010, 2011, 2012, you'd get slaughtered now. And so I think it's so, so important to, to remind ourselves, I don't really know, do you have an interval that you think of that's like, I need to rethink what I know before I put this out again? Because some of these things we've been doing and saying for over a decade now. I think it's the danger of being a parent. Right, <laughs> dispatching yep. the same dumb advice <laughs> that you learned without any context for the fact that your kids live in a completely different world. Completely different world. Yeah. It's like, you know, here's how I stood up to a bully when I was in school. Yeah, cool. But guess what? That bully's online right now. Yeah, exactly. That's not going to work. I can't kick him in the shin and run away, Dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, like that advice doesn't even make sense anymore. Right. Make sure you put a quarter in your pocket before you leave the house so you can call me if you need something. Wait, what? <laughs> it's a quarter, Dad. And so you and I always joke about the fact that as advisors, we're startup advisors, you know, big part of our life, we try to have the self-awareness to be able to say, here's my advice. However, I think you said, it's just my perspective. Yeah. I always try to caveat it with what I'm going to say next, please don't hear his advice. Please hear this as perspective and contextualize it and combine it with everything else you've heard and the things that you know, and do something with it. But be, be real careful about just taking this as wholesale. Like this isn't a step-by-step -step assembly plan. You're not building a piece of Ikea furniture. You're building a startup company. And so imagine us giving that same perspective, if you will, to ourselves. And so me staring down the mountain saying, man, last I recall, I think I was going to break my leg doing this and being like, maybe, right? But maybe I'll be just fine. And guess what? I actually did that. I actually went through that math. And I said, you know, I don't remember how well I did the last time I was in the mountain. I must have known something. So I kind of went with a fresh assumption that said, at some point, I was capable enough to make it down this mountain. Ergo, I would probably be capable enough to make it down this mountain, but I'd also like to not break my leg. And lo and behold, I made it down just fine. Within like an hour, Summer and I were crisscrossing down the mountain like it was nothing, right? It was awesome. And so I guess my point there is, had I held on to my bias, which would have been, my experience tells me I don't know how to snowboard, I would have been a guy who just didn't even go. But unlocking that and kind of getting rid of that, I think is really important to us as founders, but more importantly, new founders who are getting into the game for the first time, that's a huge advantage. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. And it's not gonna, it's not gonna prevent them from doing things. Now, we do have to caveat that with sometimes the things you don't know that you don't know that can jump up and bite you too. Oh, right? sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't pet the snake that makes the cool rattly sound, right? Like, <laughs> it seems so friendly. He was waving at me the whole time right before he bit yeah. me. Yeah. Don't touch the hot stove kind of thing. Absolutely. Look, I'm saying, I'm not saying this is a 10 out of 10 time difference. I'm saying maybe it's an eight out of 10 times. But to me as a founder, the danger of stopping and assuming everything is set in stone. This is the way we did it before. And so the outcomes will always be the same. That scares the hell out of me. That bias of my experience is actually one of the most concerning dangers as I want to stay fit, if you will, as a founder. I want to have kind of that dumb consideration that says, yeah, screw it. Let's see what happens. I don't want to lose that. You're not really going to know. And I think that's the, there's also this bias of inexperience. Right. And I think that one of the things that happens there is when we have this inexperience, sometimes we seek other people's experience and then we have a bias of their experience, meaning we haven't even lived this ourselves. We didn't try it at all, but we're going to allow that to stop us from doing something or start doing something that we shouldn't do. I think this is the other big danger is that we're more susceptible to that at that point where we don't have the experience. So I guess it's a saying like be comfortable knowing that you don't know everything and be comfortable trying and finding out yourself. I think there's a big danger in simply going to advisors, asking advice, watching a YouTube video, and then forming opinions without having actually tried. Like if you just watch, like you just jump on YouTube and type in snowboarding, I bet every other video is somebody wiping out. And you'd go, <laughs> exactly, 50% chance that I crash and die, right? Probably not, but that's what that non-learned experience would tell you. I'll give you another perfect example. This is uh, two weeks ago. You know, as you know, I'm working on building my dream home right now. And for the folks listening, when I say build it, I'm not literally building like the walls itself, but 
everything inside it from the kitchen cabinets, to the furniture, everything. I'm, my dream is to build it all myself. It reminds me of my contract on my condo, which said from the studs in, that's what I actually owned, right? So that's basically what you're working on. You're working on the condo contract version of this thing. From the studs in, it's all you. And so my general contractor comes over and we're just uh, going over the, the products. So, you know, we haven't broken ground or anything yet. I bring them into my workshop and he just sees stacks and stacks of wood. And they're all, they're all like shrink wrapped and labeled and everything. This is like closets in the house, cabinets and everything. And he's like, what have you been doing? I'm like, well, I've got a 3D model of the whole house. So I'm just building all the cabinetry in the house to spec, then flat packing it and getting it ready. So when we build the house, we'll unpack it and install it. He's like, what? He's like, how are you doing this? And I was like, well, I engineered a system because I figure like every closet kind of has roughly the same dimensions. So I engineered something in CAD to be able to mass produce them, et cetera. And then I went to a, a mill and had them mill everything the way I needed it so that it would save me tons of time and all this stuff, right? And then I take them over to my CNC machine and I'm like, I had molds cut so that every like face frame I had to make would like fit in a mold so you couldn't possibly screw it up. Yep, can't screw it up, yep. And he's like, no one does this, <laughs> right? And I'm like, well, what do you mean no one does it? He's like, look, I've been doing this for 40 years. Literally no one does this, right? <laughs> but like... He's like, where did you come up with, like, where did you find out how to do all this stuff? Now, here's what I'm saying. I didn't have the bias of experience. I didn't know you're supposed to go to a cabinet shop. Yeah. Had you gone and asked somebody, had you gone and asked him, how do I do this? He yep. would have given you totally different advice and you'd have totally different results at this point. It's remotely yep. close, right? Not to mention the fact that I've saved hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? In this process, because it turns out like if... If you just take the time to do a little bit of engineering and whatever, which again, most people wouldn't do, I also enjoy it, but you could find out that this stuff is geometrically cheaper. Now, again, this is how I like to approach things. Why not, right? In everything that I've ever done, the answer is always, you shouldn't do this, right? And my answer is, why not, right? That kind of blissful ignorance, I think is powerful, right? Conversely, when I say, oh, you shouldn't do that because I've done it before and I got a negative answer. How dangerous is, could that guidance be, right? Because anybody who's done anything interesting probably shouldn't have done it to begin with, going on the advice of the past. Yeah, for sure. I was listening to something a couple of days ago and I'm, I'm struggling to remember the source on this. They were talking about like this trap of getting caught in averages. And there's, there's a lot of discussion right now around how chat GPT or generative AI gives you the average of things. And so if you're using that, then you're, you're basically becoming the average and you're the average. So this it's brought up this entire discussion. This was going well beyond that and just talking about how dangerous it is, dangerous it is in, in marketing or business to kind of play in the averages because we don't differentiate. All these other things start to happen. But it occurs to me that there's there's a parallel here, which is that, you know, when we when we just take the average, like, OK, what's everybody else doing? All right. So chat GPT or otherwise, like even if you were just out there reading blog articles before, you were also getting the average guys, by the way, right? like chat GPT didn't do this to you. You were doing this to yourself before. And so it's a really interesting concept to think through, like if we simply do what we sort of know works or has worked based on the experience of others, even the experience of ourselves, we're not going to innovate. We're not going to push beyond. And there's no risk there. And ergo, there's there's probably very little reward. And you're going to miss out on the, the ways that you should have done something, the way that you should bring your product to the market, your service to the market, your unique perspective on things. There's an increasing danger of that as we have more and more visibility to what other people are doing and what's working. And we start to use that third party experience bias. And I think it's just crazy dangerous. So we're taking what works for granted right? A few days ago, I'm sitting and I'm watching this interview that Tim Ferriss was doing with Tom Morello. And Tom Morello, for those that don't know, is this legendary guitarist. He's the lead guitarist of Rage Against the Machine, became Audio Slave, both big bands, uh, favorites of mine. And I've been a huge Tom Morello fan forever. And it's just totally random that he winds up on this Tim Ferriss interview. Fun facts, Tom Morello, like most heavy metal guitarist of all time, went to Harvard and was a political science major. Right? Yes, <laughs> like, of course he was. And he is a, a self-admitted, this isn't me casting names, giant nerd. He's like a huge cracky, like just absolutely. As soon as he starts talking, not at all what you'd think would come out of Rage Against the Machine, right? He's, anyway, so, but Tim Ferriss is asking him like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. Like, like you went to Harvard as a political science major. How the hell did you become a heavy metal guitarist, right? To make money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, look, 
everyone else looked at the guitar in the role of guitarist through the lens of who's the best, you know? So, you know, if you're to go through like rock legends of like a Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin or, or in his era, the contemporary would have been Eddie Van Halen, right? He said, if I just play more of what Eddie Van Halen does, I'm just going to get more of the same, right? He said, so I started looking at the, the guitar as just this box of, of strings and music, right? That I could make do whatever I wanted. So he does this really cool thing. There's this incredible video. Rage Against the Machine did a live concert at Finsbury Park, I think in 2007. First song they play is Testify. It's a great song. I'm not going to get into it, but... Sing a couple bars. Just, just a couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Solo that I've never seen performed live by Tom Morello. He takes the jack to his uh, guitar, out of the guitar, the jack in his hand connects his monster stack of, of amps, and he plays the solo with him just pressing the amp cable into his palm of his hand, which creates a feedback loop. Yep, yep. But he actually plays it, right? Like, like it's a Amazing. whole thing. Yeah, he controls the, yeah, he controls the distortion. It's insane. It looked super nerdy, right? Like, <laughs> it didn't look nearly as cool as it sounds on the track, but that was his thing. He's writing on his hand with a patch cable. Not, yeah, not exactly. He, he's like, look, Eddie Van Halen's not doing that. Jimmy Page isn't doing that. I'm doing that, right? And guess what? He comes up with Testify, right? You know, these amazing, amazing songs. And I think about that and I think, damn, dude, there's no way he would have become who he is by saying, let me do more of what everybody else is doing. No, you become the average of everyone else, right? That's exactly the point. We have to avoid this because unless you just want to become an average competitor in a very busy field, which I don't think most of us set out to do, you have to do something to differentiate, right? And I think this is where this comes from. And again, using everyone else's experiences, look, lean on those experiences to find the gaps, find the, the holes, find the things that are different, figure out what hasn't been done yet, and then try to do some of that stuff. And again, to your point, why not, right? Even if you try to copy what exactly what somebody else has done, the likelihood that you're going to succeed is extremely low. So you might as well try to do something that someone else hasn't done where the odds are roughly the same for your success. But if you succeed in doing it, there's a benefit to you. You know, something that's really funny about everything we talk about here is that none of it is new. Everything you're dealing with right now has been done a thousand times before you, which means the answer already exists. You may just not know it, but that's okay. That's kind of what we're here to do. We talk about this stuff on the show, but we actually solve these problems all day long at groups.startups.com. So if any of this sounds familiar, stop guessing about what to do. Let us just give you the answers to the test and be done with it. I'll go back to that kind of challenge among advisors where we say, I want to talk to this advisor who's done something so well in my field. And obviously there's some, some value to be gained from that, right? To an extent, you touched on this a moment ago. That advice is as good as that moment in time, like you're talking about with Google AdWords, on that market opportunity at that time, at my experience at the time, as the world's experience of things at the time, right? There's, there's so much circumstantial bias to why that worked at that time. You take it with a grain of salt, like, hey, that's cool, right? It also goes the other way. When someone's telling you not to do something, there has to be a version of you, if you're any quality of founder, that says, yeah, well, maybe that won't be my result. And maybe we're just brash idiots. And we are, right? <laughs> just, that's not a maybe, we are. And maybe we're just brash idiots. But I think that mentality of what worked for you, your path isn't my path. It can help inform my path, but it's not my path. Not my path. That's it. Yeah, somebody said it once, the, the difference between bravery and stupidity only comes out in hindsight. <laughs> Right? But we have to try. We have to try to find out. I mean, and, and look, what we're talking about is aren't lives at risk in most cases. We're talking about, you know, making interesting decisions and then learning from them and moving on. So I don't think that there's a, a huge downside to trying this. Again, we're not saying like, you know, go off the rails here and just be complete nut jobs. But if you are just trying to duplicate what other people are doing, you're just going to end up as a duplicate, right? So you have to find a way to kind of scratch your own mark onto the surface here. You do. Uh, when Will was born, uh, my son, I wrote a letter to him. I thought you were referring to yourself in third party yeah. again. <laughs> when Will Schroeder, well, I guess he was Will Schroeder too. So I wrote a letter to him and I told him a whole bunch of things, like who I want him to be as a person, as a man, all these great things. And one of the things I wrote in the letter is I said, question everything, especially me. Now I'm sure I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look to regret that the rest of my life, right? With that same concept, right? Like just because it was done, just because it was right. It, one, it doesn't make it right for you. 
right? And I think that's important. And the second, it doesn't mean it's still right. It goes back to what I said at the top of the episode. You keep taking the same path to work every day. And at some point, you never stop to think, maybe there's a better one, right? And I think as founders, trying new things, like breaking our own mold, is kind of like part of our DNA. It's like, it's like what we're supposed to be good at. If we're in the gym working out muscles, that is a gym or that, that is a muscle that we are supposed to be working out, right? This idea of novelty and relearning and retraining and retrying, because I think it matters. It does. And I think, again, this is where, this is where innovation comes from. This is where your unique value comes from. Uh, we're also not saying to entirely recreate the wheel. Right. And I think that we've talked about this in other episodes. The best innovations are micro innovations because it lowers the adoption curve, all these things. If you're too innovative too early, then adoption is tough. But what's the reason why someone would adopt a new solution that's the same as the old solution, but with less track record proof and all of that stuff, if it's just the same as the old solution? Right. So there has to be something there to differentiate us. And I think to your point, like it is part of the DNA. I mean, there's there should be a reason that we set out to do these things. Very rarely is it do I do I talk to somebody who is intending to go out and build exactly the same thing somebody else says? They're like, I'm going to build uh, Salesforce, um, but with you know some differentiating factor that's going to make it. You know, the, the thing I don't like about Salesforce is it doesn't do this or doesn't do that, and we're going to address that particular problem, which is great. And I think most founders have some version of that in them where it's like, I want to put my own unique spin on this thing. The challenge then becomes, as they start and as they face all of the decisions that have to be made. At some point, we do have to have some sort of rubric for, for deciding what the right thing to do is. And we have to have some sort of a framework for decision making. And too frequently, we try to then look to see what everybody else has already done. And this is where we start to take some of the cool contours and forms off of what we're building and start to normalize it down to an average. That's where it starts to get dangerous for me, right? Again, like you don't need to recreate the wheel, but you've got to keep that individuality in there or you're not really building anything of value. I agree. I also think there's a point where it doesn't occur to you that you're even being individual. And this is taken from the other point of this discussion, which is, you know, is there an advantage of just being new to it, right? And kind of just not knowing any better. I love that. You know, I call it being too dumb to fail. And I don't mean dumb in the negative sense, right? I mean, dumb as in you just don't know any better. You don't know any better. You're not going to overthink it. You're just going to try and then you'll learn from that experience. And maybe it worked, maybe it didn't, but you'll, you'll try something else. It's every kid learning to ride a bike, right? On paper, it's actually a really bad idea. It's unstable as hell. It's moving in a direction you probably don't want to go. And you're likely almost 100% sure going to get hurt. I had an amazing professor in university that, that used several physics equations that were just a description of how to ride a bike. And it was hysterically complicated, right? Like if you look at that, you'd be like, I will never try that. I can't picture it in my mind what's actually happening there. But he was just describing, you know, the rotational dynamics, all this stuff about how you, what actually happens to make a bike work. And it was hysterical. It's the kind of thing where like, if you were to analyze it that little, you'd be like, I don't think that's even going to work. And I definitely don't trust myself to do that. I watched this years ago when we bought a boat, a lake boat, and uh, a bunch of my friends went out and we wanted to learn how to wakeboard. Uh-huh but none of us actually knew the physics of how you're supposed to wakeboard. And it was hilarious watching six morons jump in the water and try to invent how you're supposed to get out of the water in a wakeboard. It, the way you're supposed to do it for people who've never done it is almost like a leg press. You put the board essentially parallel to the back of the boat, which seems like the most counterintuitive thing to do. And then when the boat starts to take off, you leg press against the water, which essentially is what gets you up. It's the last thing most people would think to do. They're trying to get it parallel with the water and then invariably they just, the nose goes down and they get pulled to the bottom of the lake in record time. It's, I love watching it. And it's so poorly. And I think we only figured it out by accident. I think somebody like accidentally like wasn't up yet when the boat took off and they wound up out of the water. So we kind of invented wakeboarding in our own microcosm. But with that said, I think that's fascinating to me. Like, like when people aren't willing to say, hey, let me start from just like a blank slate. Like I know nothing. I'll give you one more example because we were talking about the whole thing where I was, you know, building the house or whatever. You know, as you recall, when I was going through this process, I had like an idea of what I wanted the house to be, but like a caveman drawing at best. I remember the early sketches. Yeah, yeah. I go to the architect and I'm like, hey, here's what I want. And the architect comes back with something not even remotely close. Like, like if I said like, hey, I want this car. They're like, awesome, here's a fish tank. <laughs> It's not even remotely what I said. <laughs> but at some point, I'm sitting down with what essentially was like the third architecture firm, burning all kinds of money and time, years, like to go through this process. And I asked the architect, I was like, 
is there any reason I can't just do this myself? He's like, oh, cool. You have an architecture degree you don't know about? I was like, no, no, no. I was like, initially, right? Like I get structural engineering, but initially, aren't you just like drawing boxes and like putting them together? He's like, I think you're greatly oversimplifying it. I was like, yes, I am. Yeah, I think you're greatly overcomplicating it. Exactly. I was like, but at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure I just want a bunch of boxes that are put together, right? A room is typically square, which implies it's a box, right? You know, it's a rectangle and it's always going to be nine feet tall. And so I start breaking it down. And here's why I say this. I know enough to know at my experience that really complicated stuff can be made really simple. And if I just stay too dumb to fail, I can often just motor right through it. Right. And as you know, I stuck on that thread and lo and behold, I designed the entire house myself, right? Like an infinite detail. I've walked through it in virtual reality. Yes. It was impressive. <laughs> yes, you have. That's my idea of being too dumb to fail. Like I use it as a superpower. I use it in saying, here's something I'm not supposed to be able to do. But if I put total blinders on, if I don't listen to people that tell me that I can't do it, let me see how far I can get before that advice becomes true. It is freakish how rare it is that that advice is actually what prevented me from doing anything. Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? Like you get that piece of advice early on from somebody who's been there and done that, but not done what you're about to do. And again, I think this is what's so challenging about advice and advisors and just the this experience bias is that the experiences are so contextual. They are so tied up in that moment, that time, those skills, who you are, how you were feeling, what you were thinking, what they were feeling, what they were thinking, if you're getting advice from a third party. And the relevance score on that is probably in the best cases, if it's very recent and it's, you know, somebody who's doing something really close to what you were doing, maybe 10 or 15, 20% relevance and overlap. But if you go back to like my example of, you know, me running our early Google ads 15 years ago. The relevance on that is 1%, 2%. You know, there's another side of it. There's an assumption that you were any good at it. There's also that. I can say, here's something I've done in the past, right? And it didn't work for me. And a natural question should be, yeah, maybe you weren't good at it, right? Maybe it didn't work for you because you, have you even thought about that? <laughs> right? Or like, here's a classic one. I've been divorced twice. You know, relationships don't work. Maybe uh -huh. you suck at relationships. Yeah. <laughs> Did you think about that, right? <laughs> Did that even consider like relationships don't work? You have nothing to do with that. You said it early in the episode, but it's self-awareness. And I think that so often it's mostly not malintended, but I think that you have experiences and someone asks you, you feel this obligation to hand them something, right? This is one of the disclaimers that I give at the beginning of my session for myself and for everybody else. I was like, there's only a couple of rules in this thing. Talk about the things you know please don't talk about the things you don't. <laughs> and try to be as clear about those things as you can. I don't need somebody thinking out loud and trying to decide what might work in front of a room full of people who are going to take that as gospel and run and do something with it, right? This is super dangerous. So I think it's having that self-awareness and, and being clear on what we know and what we don't know. And then I think just being super cool with what we don't know. Like to your point, don't think of that as even a knowledge deficit that we need to go fill with somebody else who does know. Because again, what they know, probably highly unrelevant, or at least just tangentially relevant to what you're doing. So figure more stuff out yourself, right? Like there's also a lot of fun in it, right? Imagine how much enjoyment, and there's been some frustration along the, along this path as well, but imagine how much enjoyment you would have missed out on in this entire home design process. For example, had you not done all of this stuff to design the boxes and stick them together, you wouldn't be doing all of the, the, the furniture, the cabinetry, all this other stuff that you're working on right now, because there'd be no context for it, right? Not only does figuring some of this stuff out yourself and, and trusting yourself and just being okay with not knowing help you in that moment, it leads to the ability to do things you otherwise wouldn't have been able to do in the future, which I think is where a lot of startups then get hung up. They get to a certain point and then they just start to try to rely on someone else's advice, someone else's experience. And this is where we see these plateaus and people just end up in that trough of average, right? Where it's working, it's not failing, it's not failing enough that it's painful to do anything about it, but it's not succeeding well enough to make it worth doing either. And so then you just end up in this position where you just don't do anything. I think then you just end up being apathetic. And that's like, you want to ask me about like, what's the worst characteristic of a founder? Like at any founder, any time, any moment, if they find themselves being apathetic to what they're doing, this is the death knell, right? For me, this is like the worst state a founder can be in.
depressed, sad, scared, worried. Cool. Like we've all dealt with that, but apathy is super dangerous. And I think it comes from like being willing to accept kind of where we're at and not being willing to push beyond on our own steam as opposed to somebody else's. I'll tell you one piece of experience that has really served me. And I think this is kind of my experience of understanding inexperience is I started like at an early age because I had to, when I was first, you know, started my first company, I had to learn finance. I had to learn design. I had to learn code because I couldn't pay anybody else to do it. So I had to learn all these things. And any one of those categories are whole industries to themselves and a domain knowledge that goes, you know, ad infinitum. However, there's some things I started to learn in this right now. I'm speaking to, you know, those that feel they're, they're not experienced enough. Okay. The Delta between having no experience and having just enough to get by is way lower than you think it is, right? So you're like, most people will say, I don't know finance, okay? Just put a baseline here. I never made it past freshman high school algebra. And I've been a CFO for 25 years, okay? Why is that? I'm no math whiz by any means, right? But Ryan, you've worked with me in a CFO capacity. I don't think we've ever missed payroll. I think our numbers seem to hold up. Like, I think I'm competent enough for the job. I help a lot of other people with the same. Why am I good at doing it? Well, because here's how I looked at it. Number one, it was my money that I was dealing with. So all of a sudden the consequences went up, but that wasn't it. Yeah. Who's going to be a better shepherd for my funds than me? I looked at it and I said, who's the most incompetent person I know that seems to do this? And is there any special skill that they have that I can't replicate? Right now, this isn't me knocking anybody. I would say the same people about pointing to me. Right. And here's what I learned. And this is you know, the virtue of an experience. If you look at it and go, okay, accounting as a whole industry is super complicated, but the, just the part that I need to do, which is like just do a basic income statement. Now, you don't know that that's not hard until you've tried it, but here's what started to happen. I just picked up what an income statement is, right? And I was like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. I never tried to become like the world's greatest CFO, right? I just did enough to figure it out. But once I un unpacked that, I was like, okay, code. Now, this is back when code was, wasn't nearly as complicated as it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. those days when I could still keep it in my head. Well, there's another argument to say that code's never been easier to learn than it is now, given the tools and everything. But that's right there. I looked at code and I said, well, I just need to know the basics. So let me just break the seal. And I did. And I was able to pick up. Same with design. Same with everything you hear me talk about. In every case, I looked at it as the delta between my experience, you know, the part that I'm concerned about, and someone else's kind of like base like line, like 101 experience could be a long weekend with a book. Yeah. It's literally where web design came from for me. It was a long weekend with a book. That's how I learned taxes. I was walking through Barnes and Noble one day. I saw this stupid book about small business taxes, and it was the highest ROI I've ever had on a weekend of learning. That <laughs> served me infinitely. Yeah. Look, as founders, I think we need to remind ourselves that experience is great. Um, but it can come with some challenges, comes with some bias. I think it's also really important to note that as we look at the current environment that we live in, how fast things change, there's always going to be more coming that we need to learn that's of value than the things that we've already learned. And so I think putting an emphasis on what I know versus what I'm going to know is a really dangerous move. And so instead of thinking about, here's everything I need to know, let's take what we do know and let's apply it as well as we can take some learnings from it, and just be willing to move on. So in addition to all the stuff related to founder groups, you've also got full access to everything on startups.com. That includes all of our education tracks, which will be funding, customer acquisition, even how to manage your monthly financers. There's so much stuff in there. All of our software, including BizPlan for putting together detailed business plans and financials, LaunchRock for attracting early customers, and of course, Fundable for attracting investment capital. When you log into the startups.com site, you'll find all of these resources available.